Well, hello, everybody. Good to see you. My name is Nate. Uh, everybody who's joining us online in the room, I'm glad we get to be together. Hey, we are going to jump into our message. We're going to eventually end up in Matthew chapter 25. And I, I just got to tell you, these are very direct words that Jesus speaks. We got to know this, his audience his disciples, okay? So if you are, um, we call it, you know, spiritually unresolved, you're not sure what you believe, there's good news. It's like, this isn't for you. But for those of us who would say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus, Jesus is going to say some really strong words, and here's the theme. The theme is stewardship, stewardship. So stewardship isn't a word that we use very often in the English language, um, the, even the idea of someone being a steward, you might see that in an old movie, they're kind of a servant. But this is a theme throughout the Bible. And we first engage this idea of human beings, okay? All of us being stewards at the very beginning of the Bible, God makes this incredible world. And then he looks at Adam and Eve and he wants to make something very clear. You don't own this place. This is mine. But I am asking you to be stewards of my creation. So he looks at Adam and Eve and he says, you have a unique job. Unlike any of the other created entities, your job is to represent me. Your job is to look at creation and actually enhance it and make it better, but never to feel like you own the world around us. And then this theme continues with, has to do with finances, it has to do with gifts and talents and abilities, it has to do with relationships, that God is constantly trying to remind people that this world belongs to him and we act as stewards on this planet. And I just got to tell you right now, for North Americans who grow up in a capitalistic society, this is one of the more challenging things for us to even consider. Because we, here's what we do. We tend to live our lives this way is that the more that we have, the more security or the more finances or the more uh, influence, we hold on to it and we say this little word that everybody learned when they were a toddler. You guessed it, mine. You never have to teach a child to say that. There's not a parent that ever said, okay, mine. They just know it, right? They know it. And we as human beings, here's our tendency, is we want to take, collect, gather, claim ownership and hold on to it and say, no, 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 this is mine. This is my security. This is my peace. This is my future. And we want to hold on. And it, it, here's, like, if there was one point of imagery, I think the point of being a follower of Jesus is that we reverse from here to here and we just say it's yours. It's yours. I do not believe that human beings were created to have a sense of ownership. And when we get stuck into that, it creates so many challenges, so much anxiety in our life, but this sense of it's yours, it's yours. So you'll see this throughout the scripture. And then Jesus speaks these very poignant and I would say incredibly challenging words in Matthew chapter 25. He's gonna do one parable where he talks all about what it means to be a steward, but here's the context. It's very important to understand the context. This has to do with more than finances. Okay, finances are a part of it, but it is so much bigger. What God has entrusted to human beings, it isn't just about our money. This is a, a mentality that being a steward doesn't just have to do with bank accounts. Being a steward has to do with my life, my energies, how I spend my time, how I forgive, how I love, all of that it has to do with stewardship. So here's the setting. This is one of the last days that Jesus has with his disciples before he'll be arrested and crucified. The end of the book of Matthew. His disciples are walking with Jesus and they're walking around the edge of the temple in Jerusalem, which is this magnificent building. Um, and they are, so they're just young Jewish guys, right? And they look at the temple and they are so proud of it. It is amazing for a period of time, it was considered one of the wonders of the world. Herod pretty much bankrupted the nation in order to build this. And it is, it's a colossus. Like on the Temple Mount, you can fit 
no less than seven full football fields. It is this massive thing. There's a stone, one of the chief cornerstones. It's 49 feet long. It's nine and a half feet tall. And we estimate it weighs somewhere between 400 and 600 tons. So when you think about first century people carving this perfect stone, how do you move it? How do you engineer it? And then they build this massive building on top of it. So the disciples say, Jesus, in the temple, amazing. <laughs> um, it, like, it's beautiful, like the engineering, what it says about us as humans that we were able to build this. And here's what Jesus says, rather than agreeing, he goes, I tell you the truth. Not one stone will remain upon another. And this is like bad news if you're a Jewish person. Like what? This is the sign of our nationalism, our pride. This is our religion. And Jesus, you're telling us that this whole thing is gonna be toppled over? And so what's their next, next question? When? Like, right? Whenever anybody talks about the future, it's called apocalyptic literature in the Bible. Here's the first question that everybody asks. Well, when is that going to happen? And Jesus never addresses the when. Here's what he addresses. He says, I want to talk about the how. The how. So 40 years later, in 70 AD, Rome is going to come in. Rome is going to destroy the temple. What Jesus said is going to come true. But Jesus said, that's not the important thing. The important thing is this, is that I'm here with you now. And one of just the core teachings of the Bible is that one day Jesus is coming back. And everybody wants to ask when? I have no idea. It could be next year. It could be a thousand years away. I, I don't know. What Jesus wants to talk about, what he wants his disciples to focus on is how do you live in this interim? How do you engage with the world around you? And Jesus is going to tell this parable, which is a, it's a story, it's a literary tool that he uses in order to talk about the how. He goes, here's what I want you to focus on, not when I'm coming back, not what's gonna happen, but I want you to focus on how you're called to live in this waiting period. So really you could say this, it's about living during the waiting, living during the waiting. And here's why I think this applies to all of us is we've got to figure out, like, how do we tackle life? Like, what do we do? Is, is, it, is it enough to just survive, to just get by? And Jesus is using these words to say, no, no, I want, I want you to do more than just survive, all right? So let's jump into Matthew 25, Jesus' very direct conversation regarding stewardship. Now, I want to warn you, towards the end, there's some really challenging words that Jesus has for one of the servants. There's three characters in this story. There's a master and then there's three servants. And there are three servants who are different individuals and are given different levels of stewardship. And for two of them, the story ends up great. And for the third one, not so much, all right? So let's talk about how do we live in the in-between state. Matthew 25, we'll start at verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. So Jesus is gonna say, as I'm going away and you don't know when I'm gonna return, it's just like a man in the story. He goes away on a journey for an indefinite period of time who called his servants. Okay, these are people that work for him. This is the idea of stewardship. These servants, he called his servants and entrusted them, his wealth to them. So the word entrusted, this is a, it's a really, really interesting word. From the master's perspective, what does that mean? Is he, he brings his servants and he sees in his servants the capacity and, and he trusts them, he believes in them. So he says, here's my wealth, I believe in you. I'm going to entrust you with my wealth. So this is, this is the methodology of God. This is why stewardship is an issue because God has trusted in human beings more than I feel like he should, okay? He entrusted creation to them. Jesus, as he's getting ready to leave planet Earth after his resurrection, he entrusts everything to his church. He looks at his followers and he says, now I entrust you 
with the message that I came to deliver to humanity. I entrust you with the mission I came. I entrust you with this capacity to tell people who I am, to begin to bring about change in this world with everything that was so essential in Jesus' ministry. He entrusts it to human beings. God is a God who believes in stewardship. He believes in giving things away. So entrusted, um, here's an example. Anybody learned how to teach someone to drive? Oh my goodness. Four of the most experience, like frightening experiences of my life have been teaching kids how to drive. And by the way, by the way, uh, I have an office right up here and it looks out over the north parking lot. And a lot of you use this church's parking lot <laughs> to teach your kids how to drive. I have seen two people run into light posts. Two, out my window, right? It's big and it's open, but apparently not open enough. But you know that, that, that feeling, it's like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And, and you, like, you have to trust this kid. And then they get their, they go for their test and in the back of your mind, there's like, there's no way they'll pass. Like, I don't even have to worry about this. And they come out with a smile on their face and you're like, oh. And here's what they expect when you're leaving the DMV, they're gonna drive home, <laughs> right? So here, here was like one of my biggest mistakes. We couldn't get an appointment here, but we got an appointment in Forsyth. So I drive with one of my kids all the way to Forsyth. It happens to be like in the middle of, it's cold and snowy and he comes out and he's got his driver's license and I'm thinking, dear God in heaven, <laughs> he's gonna wanna drive home all the way, right? So there's this level of entrust that you believe, even though you're, you're wondering, you, you invest something in them. You hand them the car keys. This is what God does. This is his part of stewardship. As he looks at people and we think, well, I, I can't do that. He goes, I, no, I, I'm going to entrust this to you. Take the keys. Let's go on. To one, one of the three servants, he gave five bags of gold to another two bags and to another one bag of gold. Each according to his very key word. His ability, okay? They get differing amounts, but it has to do with their ability. Not his favoritism, not that some are more worthwhile than the others. There's no difference in value. He just understands that there are differing abilities. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. Also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more, but the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought, uh, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me. So he understands this. Like you saw in me the capacity to not lose your money. You entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's Happiness. I love this phrase right here because this is key to understanding this parable. That Jesus is saying what? The master is happy, right? The master is happy. The master wants people to win. He wants them to thrive. And, and this guy with five goes, hey, you entrusted me. I don't know if I believed in myself, but here's what I did. I, I, I applied myself and here you go. And the master's like, excellent, well done. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, please notice, it is the exact same phraseology as the guy who brings back five. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. Okay, we're going to see a completely different mentality. The first two say, you entrusted this to me. 
Like, you believe that I can handle this. The third man, his perception is that the master is hard and will read unfair. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not gathered or scattered seed. So his perception of the master is what? The master is unfair, is demanding, and is unreasonable. So I was afraid. Because I know those things about you. It caused me to be afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. So here, here's what belongs to you. This is, this is where this parable gets really challenging. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Wouldn't it be nice if he said, you super conservative investor? <laughs> right? Like, wow, you really want to make sure you didn't lose. But the master says, what you did is not conservative. It's wicked and it's lazy. And then dripping with sarcasm, the master says, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Like at the minimum, at the minimum, don't hide. Like you, sh you should have found something. Like the master would have been okay if, hey, here's 3% back. I I'd be okay with that. But what I'm not okay with is you digging a hole and hiding everything. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has five bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that, okay, we already have wicked and um, lazy. Throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, we read this, and here's one of my primary concerns as we read this, that um, so often in our, in our ideology, we start to think, oh man, this is about whether or not God could love me in salvation, I have to earn it, and if I don't do more, God will be disappointed. What we need to do is differentiate. When it comes to experiencing spiritual resurrection and new life in God, that is 100% grace. Okay, I don't earn it. I don't achieve it. Salvation isn't based on my behavior. What Jesus is talking about is something else. He's talking, remember, to his disciples. He's not speaking to the crowds. So he's speaking to a group of people who all understand that grace is how you get into a relationship with God. But he says, what I want you to think about is how you live your life. I want you to consider, like, what does it mean to be a steward during this interim time where we are here on planet earth waiting for him to come back. And he is urging through these very strong words, urging his followers to be active and involved. So here's what I'd like to do. I want to go through six principles on stewardship because this is incredibly important to Jesus. Number one, first principle on stewardship is simply this. Realize that everything belongs to the master. Everything. Everything belongs to the master. In fact, I would say this. I think the stewardship begins when I refuse ownership. When rather than saying mine, I learn to fight against that innate desire to accumulate and find security in things and hold on to and be in control of everything, which leads to incredible amounts of anxiety as I begin to live my life this way, that I trust God. And I was not designed to be an owner. I was designed from my inception, according to Genesis 1 and 2, to be a steward. That it is God's. And my job in life is not to hold on to and accumulate and keep resources for myself and secure my future. My job is to live my hands with my life with open hands and saying, God, you're the owner. I understand my role is to be a steward of the things that you entrust to me. He entrusts to you and I his words, his teachings. 
these radical countercultural perspectives of loving enemies, of forgiving when we're offended. You've entrusted that to me and rather than hold on and keep, I'm gonna live my life like this with open hands. And ladies and gentlemen, this takes a tremendous amount of practice because you and I have been saying mine since we were two years old. We have been believing that the more I have, the better I am. And stewardship says, no, 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 it is not mine. It is his. And God knew what a challenge, what a temptation this is in human lives. When he designs uh, his initial values for the Jewish people, he, he like centers into their culture and their financial realities a way for them to every month exercise the stewardship, the principle of stewardship. So it's the, the whole idea of a tithe, which means a tenth. And God says, even economically, here's what I want you to do. Because every human being is gonna struggle with the mind concept. I want you to every month practice giving something to me. Give me 10% so that every month you're battling. You're battling with the mind mentality. You're saying, okay, rather than it's mine, I'm gonna say it's yours. And I'm, I'm gonna... I'm gonna work against the toxicity in my soul. So stewardship begins with this mentality. God owns everything. That car you drive, that house you live in, but also all the problems, they're his. I am meant to be a steward, not an owner. Here's the second principle of stewardship. Stewardship is not about, and we'll get to it, second principle. Stewardship is not about fairness, but about responsibility and partnership. Okay, it's not about fairness, but about responsibility and partnership. So, like, we just want everything to be fair, right? I understand we build political and even economic models on this idea of fairness. I understand why. I, um, I'm the oldest of five kids in my family of origin. And my brother Jake, he's just a little younger than me, we're, we're 18 months apart. And like, we battled with fairness. We were frenemies. We were like best friends. And like, we fought about everything all the time. And this is not a joke. My mom would say, hey guys, set the table. And we'd pour glasses of milk. And we'd put, we'd put them next to each other. <laughs> He's got more. And so you'd like top it off. Everything had to be fair all the time. And when it wasn't, Man, did we let mom and dad know about that. that is not fair. You discipline me. You're so much harder on me. That's not fair, right? And so we have this thing where we want everything to be fair. But the principle of stewardship is not about fairness. It has to do with what? Ability. Ability. And so the master isn't, like, he's not saying there's, there's, uh, descending values of worth that this person he's worth so much because boy I can trust him with five bags of gold and this person two and this person only one there is nothing about uh, that that has to do with worth just the master looks and, and he's like man I love that one bag guy he's doing the best he can and here's what I know this is why fairness is beautiful God doesn't give the guy that has the ability to handle one bag or two bags of gold. He doesn't give them more than they can handle and then demand, I want five bags back. So here's the beauty. <laughs> like, I know that some of us, you know, like we struggle with pride, but most of us feel insecure more than anything. And God just looks at you and he's like, oh, you're so cute. Oh, mm. this special bless. It's that phrase, like, bless his heart, right? <laughs> like, I know what he's capable of. And my, my love for him or for her has nothing to do with their productivity. I understand their ability. So I, I will give you what you can handle. And no more than that. And if, if you really think about the stewardship thing, it, like it works its way out into all types of, of realities in our world, economic, social, all of this, is that not everybody is the same. 
Well, that doesn't mean that some people are more worthy or, 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 or better or more valued than others. No, we're just different. And the beauty is your creator knows what your abilities are. And he will never demand from you more than you can actually do. So you're never in this massive deficit, I can't do this. It's just like, okay, God, I'm not gonna look at what he got and I'm not gonna look at what she has. I'm gonna look at my reality and you know that I am capable, my abilities are equal to this and I'm only responsible for this. I'm not responsible for more. I'm responsible for this. Here's the third uh, principle of stewardship. Stewardship is active and not passive. Okay, here, here's what I mean by this. Um, oftentimes in church settings, we talk about faithfulness. And faithfulness is important. Faithfulness is that it's perseverance. You just keep going. But I, I, like we have to understand that when Jesus is talking about living and thriving, he is not just like, here's what I want you to do. I want you just to gut it out. Just try to survive. Just see if you can make it. That's not stewardship. Stewardship is about a God who goes, hey, I know what you're capable of. I designed you. I love you. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to engage yourself. I want you to be involved in this world. It's not just about faithfully getting by and like hoping for heaven. God says, Faithfulness is one part of stewardship. But there's another part that is you're looking around and you're like, God, you entrusted me with this one bag of gold. You entrusted me with this family. You entrusted me with this neighborhood I live in. You entrusted me with your message and your ministry. And so, God, here's who I am. I'm, I'm not a five per, bag of gold person. I'm a one, I'm a two, I'm a three. And here's what I'm gonna do. I am not gonna bury what you gave me. I refuse to bury it. Faithfulness is not the key right here. I'm going to be faithful, but I am not going to be passive. It's not about burying and just surviving and getting through. Jesus says, in this interim period, I want more than just passive faithfulness. I want engagement. Here's the fourth principle of stewardship. Stewardship means that I am only responsible for what I've been entrusted with, okay? I just want to go back to this for just a moment because here's what I know. I know, I know that there are many of us who were dealt, we, we have all kinds of phrases, like I was dealt like the short end of the stick, okay? You're, you're thinking, Nate, like my family of origin, do you, do you know how much baggage I was born with just simply being born into that family? Do you know what has happened to me? Some of us, we look and we think, like, I was born with what I've got in terms of intellectual capacity. I wasn't born beautiful. I wasn't born outgoing and, and, and like, I, I can't attract people. I get that. I get that. Um, one, of my, one of my heroes in my life is a, a friend who lives in Oregon. He was born with cerebral palsy, uh, physical challenges. It, it would just go on and on. And you, you could say this. You could say like, man, you were dealt all the wrong cards. And here's what he's done. He said, I'm going to take the cards that I was dealt. And I'm going to be the best possible steward. If I continually think about everything I don't have, that I was born in this situation and this painful thing, it is so easy to develop a victim mentality. And like, this is all I've got. And a victim mentality will always make me just be passive and feel like life was unfair. And please hear me, whatever you have, God, God says, that's enough. And I am only holding you accountable. So take the reality that you were born with. Take the reality of your family situation and say, there isn't much here. 
but my job is to do the best possible for the master. I'm gonna take this reality And one day when he comes back, I'm like, God, I was born with two pennies and here's four. And you know what the master's going to say? Well done. The reward is for stewardship. It has nothing to do with how much you can produce in your life. It's this idea that, God, this is all I've got but it's all I'm responsible for. And I believe that you're a rewarding God. And so I'm gonna take the bit I have and I am going to double it for you. I wanna give you more than what, you, what I was born with. My family didn't give me much, but here's what I can give. I can give to the next generation this. I Man, I was born into a family that has addictive tendencies and there's so much dysfunction. That's what I received, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hand off to the next generation something different. I'm going to break that addiction cycle in my family of origin. You're only responsible for what you've been given. Here's the fifth principle of discipleship. And this is absolutely essential because uh, this makes sense of the whole thing. Without this, it doesn't make sense. My perception of the master will determine my stewardship. Okay. We don't have a lot of dialogue on how the first two individuals perceive the master, but we, we know this. They said, you entrusted something to me. Like you believe in me. Here's what we do know. We do know that the man who had one bag of gold, what motivates him? Fear. Fear. And a skewed perspective of who the master is. You are a hard man. You're demanding. You reap where you did not sow. When my perception of God is that he is angry, disappointed. I will be afraid of him and I will dig a hole and I will hide whatever he has put into my life to steward because I'm gonna play it safe because the mentality for this third man was this, I'm gonna be in so much trouble because my master is angry and he is frustrated and he's so easily ticked off. The, the better path for me, my fear drives me just to dig a hole and bury it and hide and hide. And what does Jesus call that? He doesn't call that passivity. He doesn't call that, oh, I'm so sorry you were scared. He says, that actually is wicked and that is lazy. So here's the challenge. Many of us, we have perceptions of God that are terribly inaccurate. Oftentimes we superimpose things with our own earthly father onto the father in heaven. That can be good or that can be bad, depending on who your dad was. But if your perception, if your perception of God is this, he is like this close to losing it on you, right? Do you ever grow up with a dad who was like that? You're like, (laughs) if your perception of God is that... He is demanding from th- things from you that are absolutely unfair. Here's what, fear will begin to motivate my life and I, I, will, I will find the safest route possible and rather than be a steward, I'll just be a guard. I'm just gonna guard. Like I, I don't wanna lose anything because I'm so afraid of God. In order to be a steward, please hear this. This is the most important thing. You have to believe that your God is kind and merciful and filled with joy and he takes pleasure in you simply for being you. Because what does the master say? He goes, enter into my happiness. The master, the master is nothing like the third servant believed. He says, like if you weren't so afraid, you could have at least like, the master would be okay if you just put it in with the banker and brought back 3%, that's okay. That's okay. What's not okay is to live your life terrified of God. Believing the lie that he is unkind and harsh and lacks grace. That will be the thing that interrupts my stewardship more than anything else. What's your perception of the master? If you feel like I'm holding on, like I am am not, 
a good steward of what he's entrusted to me. His message, his ministry, the resources, the finances. Here's what I'd say. I need you to look at your perception of God. Because if you're living in fear, you're afraid of God. You have the wrong perception of God. You don't approach him. When you can understand that God is loving, that he is for you, not against you, then you have this boldness to go like, okay, every one of these people, the first two, they had to take a risk. Whatever they did, we don't know the details on how they multiplied the money, but every opportunity you have to multiply something is infused with risk, isn't it? Like they had to go like, okay, oh man, oh, I could turn five into 10 or I could turn five into one. But here's what I know. As long as I was moving forward and I'm not digging a hole and hiding it, I believe the master is going to be okay with me. I'm not reckless, right? But I believe that the master is kind. And that leads us to our final principle on stewardship. Principle number six is this. The end goal is to hear the master say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. So I get to be a part of a lot of funerals. You know the hardest funerals? Um, they're funerals where everybody has to be creative. It's tragic. You have to come up with something memorable, something significant, come up with some memory. Like I've watched families like manufacture, like, okay, yeah. Oh. You know what that life is? That's the life that you dug a hole. The best are these. It, it's about people who took what God gave them and they took their family of origin and they took whatever resources they had, and they just lived in this magnificent, hands open, engaging the world, entrusting themselves to God fashion. That they gave away freely love and forgiveness and compassion and kindness. It's not the people, you don't celebrate the people who are like, they died with a massive bank account. That was awesome. I've never done a funeral where everybody's like, oh yeah, my grandpa had millions locked up. It's, it's the life where you go, I'm gonna live my life open-handed and here's what you wanna hear. This is what I wanna hear. This is what I want you to hear. That whether you come with your two pennies or your 200 bags of gold at the end of your life that you took whatever God entrusted to you and you said, I lived. I believe that you're a good God. And I stepped forward. I wasn't motivated throughout my life by fear. I didn't bury things. I just stepped forward and I took whatever it is, little or big. And whether you come with little at the end of your life or you come with much, here's what you want to hear him say. Well done good and faithful servant. Enter into your happiness. Enter into this relationship. At the end of life, so, so often we, we think of life like a game of Monopoly, right? In Monopoly, what's the goal? The goal is to like be a tyrant. The goal is to like get hotels on property and then charge exorbitant rent to people. And to make the biggest stack of fake money imaginable, right? That's the goal of Monopoly. Here's the bad news with Monopoly. When the game ends, everything goes back in the box, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're not like the landlord any longer. It all went back in the box. I'll tell you what, end of life, it all goes back in the box. You cannot take anything with you. So why not be a steward of everything God put into your hands and trusted you with? Why not live for him? You hear him say, well 